Okay, so in this video, we're going to be covering 2.7. And yeah, I just posted the other one. Okay, this one is about inverse functions. And so the reason why we had to cover the composition functions beforehand is because one of the things in, that we're going to learn in this section is that if you find the composition f of g and you find the composition g of f, if both of those, after all the simplifying, if both of those turn out to just look like x, then you know that f and g are what are called inverses of each other, OK? Um, so first, before we get to that, because that's the whole reason why I had to cover compositions, is so that when we got to that part of this le lecture, um, we knew what a composition was, right? Um, but for now, we're just going to just define the inverse functions and then talk about that relationship with the uh, compositions. And then we're going to get into um, a test. You know, I know y'all remember the, well, I hope you remember the vertical line test. There's another test called the horizontal line test. And I'll explain to you what that does. Um, and then eventually we'll find inverses, OK? So yeah, if you give me two functions, I could use the compositions to tell you whether or not they are inverses of one another. But eventually, if you just give me one function, I should be able to find its inverse, if one exists, OK? So let's jump right into this. OK, so where are we? There we go. So it says, we know that a set of ordered pairs can represent a function. For instance, f of x equal to x plus 4. Um, and from the set 1, 2, 3, 4, the set uh, 5, 6, 7, 8 can be written as follows. So 1, when you plug in 1, it maps to 5. 2, when you plug in 2, it maps to 6. 3, when you plug in 3, it maps to 7. And 4, when you plug in 4, it maps to 8. So one is mapped to five, two is mapped to six, three is mapped to seven, and four is mapped to eight, right? The X values from A and the Y values from um, B, okay? So basically A is the, the, A is the domain and B is the range, okay? But if you interchange the first and second coordinates in each of these points, OK, so you swap it. You write it as 5 comma 1, 6 comma 2, 7 comma 3, and 8 comma 4. So you just basically took these and swapped them around, OK? That swapping is literally the definition of an inverse, OK? So an inverse function is when you take the inputs and the outputs of a function, and then you swap the inputs and the outputs, OK? So your inputs are now the outputs, and your outputs are now the inputs, OK? And we denote it like this. This does not mean f to the negative 1 exponent, which means f with the positive exponent or just 1 over f, OK? That is not what this means, OK? This is just the notation that we use. It is not an exponent. Remember, I always tell you when you have f of x, f is just a name. And so is this. This is just telling you the inverse of f, OK? But it's just a name. It's not a mathemat It's not an algebraic um, expression there. It's just a name, a title, OK? So notice that when they did swap them, right, they wrote f inverse of x, OK? And they even gave you the operation. They gave you the robot. They're telling you what the robot's doing with all of these old outputs that are now my inputs, and then these old inputs that are now my outputs, OK? So if you recognize the pattern, what's happening with all of these? We're not adding 4 anymore. If I go from this input to this output, I'm actually subtracting 4. So they gave me the robot information, OK? We will not always be given the robot information. We will be asked to find it, OK? So again, if you draw images, here you have some x's. When you plug them into f, you get y values, f of x, right? And if you take those y values and you plug them into the inverse, you will get the original x's. 
Okay. So what happens if I go all the way around? What if I take a number, I plug it into F, I get an output, and then you plug that output into the inverse, and then you get the same input that you started with, okay? So that's why it says here that F and F inverse have an undoing effect, okay? You know some functions like that already. I know you do, you just don't think about it. Um, here, they're obviously showing me that if I add four, and if I subtract four, isn't adding four and subtracting four inverses one of another? What about if I square and then I square root? Those are inverses of each other. If I cube and then I cube root, those are inverses of each other. Um, and then there's some other relationships that are not so obvious that are actually inverses of each other, okay? Um, so, in order for you, if you're given two functions, one function and another function, okay? Notice here that they're doing F of F inverse. So first you replace the inside stuff, this part, with what we had for the formula that we had for F inverse. Then I take that formula and I plug it in for X into the F function. Remember F was X plus four. So now I have this plus four. And then these guys will cancel and I'll just be left with X. Now, if I do it the other way around, now I'm talking about this guy on the inside and the formula for that was X plus four. And if I plug that into the inverse, it's gonna be that same X minus four. And then these fours cancel and I just am left with X, okay? And so that is a, um, you're not finding the inverse, you're basically verifying whether something is an inverse, okay? Um, so notice that it says verify that both of these two things um, equal X, okay? So in order for something to be a function, uh, you definitely have to have um, that relationship, okay? So to be a function, f of f inverse must equal x and so must f inverse of f. If you do this computation and you do not get x, there's not even no reason to do the other computation because it's already not true. Or if you do this computation and you find out that it's not equal to x, then there's no sense in doing the other one because it's already no good. But if you do one of these, and after simplifying, you get X, then do the other one and see if you also get X. Because sometimes it works out that only one of them gives you X and then the other one doesn't, okay? They both have to equal exactly just X in order for you to say, yes, these two guys are inverses of another. And so I don't like to put F inverse because sometimes I don't know if it's actually an inverse. I just know it's some other function, okay? So you'll be given two functions and they'll ask you, are the two functions inverses? Well, I don't know, let me plug one into the other and then vice versa and see if I just get X, okay? So here they're saying, find the inverse of F of X equal to four X. And they're saying, notice that this function multiplies every single input by four. So how do you undo multiplying by four? You divide by four, right? So they're saying, well, we'll take all of those outputs and we'll, or inputs and we'll divide them by four. And the multiplying by four and the dividing by four should undo each other, okay? Well, that's their, their goal, their hope, right? They're thinking that that's what's gonna happen. So let's verify that that's true, okay? So the first one is to do F of F inverse, okay? And so F inverse, they defined it as X over four and if I plug that into F, remember F was 4X. So this becomes the X. So I have four and this becomes the X. Well, these guys cancel and I do just get X, okay? So now I'm gonna do the reverse. I'm gonna do F inverse of F. So what is F? F is 4X. And then if I take F inverse, which happens to be X over four, I'm gonna replace the X in the numerator with what's in this parentheses. And then these cancel and I get X again. So we can conclude that yes, 
f um, inverse or four over x over four is in fact the inverse of four x. Okay. So here's a definition, the formal definition, right? Two functions, f and g. Um, if you do one composition and you get x, and then you do the other composition and you get x, then f, then g is the inverse of f. And instead of writing g, you can write it as f inverse, okay? Now, this is also an important bit of information, okay? Because if you look at that photo where they had this and this, and then they had the two arrows, so you had an x, you plugged it into f, and then you got a y value f of x. That became your input into this guy, right? Um, and so then you got the output. So what they're saying is notice that this is what you're plugging in. So that's the domain of f. So my x's are going into f, so that's the domain of f. But notice those are also the outputs of the f inverse. So they equal the range of the f inverse. And vice versa, notice that after I plug it in, I get these outputs and those become the inputs. So the range of F is actually equal to the domain of F inverse. Why is this important? Because it's super hard to figure out what ranges are. You really gotta sit there and think about them, but it's not very difficult to figure out what, invert, what domains are. We know domain is usually all real numbers, um, except when you have fractions or radicals. So in that case, I could figure out what the domains are of each of those two expressions, and then I would automatically know what the ranges are of the other, okay? So this is super helpful, this information. And we will use that information if they ever ask me about domains and ranges, okay? And I think I already mentioned this, but it says, do not be confused by the use of the negative one to don't denote the inverse function. Um, it is always referred to as the inverse function and never referred to as like the reciprocal, right? Like the negative makes it a fraction downstairs. So never is it considered the reciprocal of X, never F of X. Um, and then if the function G is the inverse of the function F, it must also be true that the function f and the inverse is the inverse of g. So basically, it's not that one is particularly the inverse. They're inverses of each other, OK? It goes both ways. They are inverses of each other. Um, so that's why, for the most part, we always just say they are functions of each other. So now when we talk about the graphs, we already know that um, and this is a good thing. They, when they first started the discussion about inverses, we literally swapped coordinates, right? And because you're swapping those coordinates, if I have the coordinates A, B on my original function, when I swap them, it's going to be B, A, okay? Um, and then those are the points that are on my inverse. Well, if you notice, if, excuse me. If you do that for every single point here, you get all of these points here. And if you notice, it's actually a reflection over the line y equals x. If you draw the line y equals x, you notice that it acts like a mirror to this, these two functions. This function looks exactly like that function if that line were the mirror, right? There's somebody's face, and in the mirror, there's their face again. Okay, but as a reflection. Um, why is that important? That's important because I can tell you the inverse. If you give me a list of points, I could tell you the inverse just by swapping the points. If you give me a graph, I could tell you what the inverse is, again, by swapping the coordinates, okay? Or if you're giving me an image with no points on it whatsoever, I can at least mirror that image over y equals x to tell you what the inverse graph is going to look like, okay? The one thing that we have not been able to do just yet is if I don't give you the graph and I don't give you points, if I just give you this, how on earth do I find the inverse of that, okay? That's the only piece that we have not discussed yet, okay? But before we get to that, we're going to thoroughly talk about this graph stuff, okay? 
So it says, if you sketch the graphs of both of these functions, this is what the graph of f of x equal to 2x minus 3 looks like. It's this image here with all of these coordinates, OK? And then if you were to graph this function, um, 1 half x plus 3 halves, it would look like this point here with all of these points. And if you notice, look, 3 and 3, if I swap 3 and 3, it's still 3 and 3, which is why they both share that same point. But here, if I took 2 comma 1 and I swapped it, I end up with 1 comma 2. If I take 1 and negative 1 and swap them, I end up with negative 1 and 1. If I take 0 and negative 3 and swap it, I end up with this point right here. Um, and then if I take negative 1 and negative 5 and I swap it, I end up with this point right there. Okay. And so they're just saying, notice that if you look, took all those points for the original f and you swap them over, you would get all the points for the inverse. So now we're going to talk about these one-to-one -one functions. So the reflective property of the graphs of inverse functions gives you a nice geometric test for determining whether a function has an inverse, OK? This test is called the horizontal line test for inverse functions. The horizontal line test for inverse functions says that a function f has an inverse function if and only if no horizontal line intersects the graph of f at more than one point. So remember the vertical line test. You would draw the picture, and then you would imagine a million vertical lines. And as any one of those imaginary vertical lines touched the graph more than once, then it was immediately not a function, OK? Now what we're saying is that now if you imagine a million horizontal lines, OK, and any one of those horizontal lines touches your graph more than once, then that graph is not going to have an inverse, OK? It's just not. I mean, it'll have an inverse, but it won't be an inverse function because when you flip the coordinates over, you'll get the image of something that does not pass the vertical line test, OK? And in order for it to be a function, it has to pass the vertical line test. So yeah, the function you give me might be a function, and it might pass the vertical line test. But as soon as I swap over all those coordinates, the result might not pass the vertical line test, OK? And how do we figure out whether that's going to happen or not? Well, remember, vertical lines are represented by x. And horizontal lines are represented by y. And isn't that exactly what we're doing when we're finding inverses is we're swapping the x's and the y's. So we're basically swapping the vertical line test for the horizontal line test to see if the inverse would actually be an inverse function. OK? So um, what else does it tell me? And it says this is the essential characteristics of what we call one-to-one -one functions. So it gets a name. So if you can pass the vertical line test, you are a function. If you can pass the horizontal line test, then you are a one-to-one -one function, OK? And only one-to-one -one functions have inverses, OK? And that's essentially what this is telling you, that when one x corresponds to one y, nobody else has that x and nobody else has that y, then that function will have an inverse, OK? Now, let's look at this. It says, consider the function given by f of x equals x squared, OK? Well, one, I can look at the graph of that as well, OK? Now. What happens is, is that if you were to plug in negative 2 into um, y equals x squared, OK, you would get uh, 4 and then positive 1, right? I don't know why that says that, but you would get positive 1, OK? And then if you plug in 0, 0 squared is 0, 1 squared is 1, 2 squared is 4, 3 squared is 9. So this is f, OK? This is the, the box for f. Now, if you swap those around, OK? So now these are my x's and these are my y's, OK? 
notice that this is not going to pass, okay? This is not the definition of a function. Don't you have two x's with different y's? And that was the definition of the horizontal, of the vertical line test. Essentially what happens is if I graph these, you end up with this image, right? Now, even though the original function passes the vertical line test, the inverse function, the inverse of it does not pass the vertical line test, okay? So yeah, there's an inverse, okay? But it's not an inverse function, okay? In order for me to know that I'm gonna have an inverse function, I not only have to pass the vertical line test, but I also have to pass the horizontal line test. And as you can see with this pink line, I clearly do not pass the horizontal line test because I just hit the graph more than one time, okay? And so you wouldn't even need to know what this one looks like at all. If you just apply the horizontal line test, you would know that the other one is not gonna pass the vertical line test, okay? Um, however, however, if I were to restrict the domain of this function to just x greater than or equal to zero, that means that only my inputs are these guys. I won't have any inputs over here, which means if I don't have any inputs over there, I won't have a graph over there. There's no outputs there. So really, you just have this graph. Well, doesn't this graph pass the vertical line test and the horizontal line test, right? And when I swap all the points over, it will correspond to this image. And that does pass the vertical line test now, okay? So sometimes you might have functions that may not have an inverse on their own, but if you restrict the domain on them, then they may have an inverse because now half of the graph is gone, right? Or a chunk of the graph can be gone and then it will still have an inverse, okay? So I just want you to be aware of that, especially if you see something like x squared and you're like, hey, you showed us in the picture that x squared doesn't have an inverse. But in the question, it says x squared comma x greater than or equal to zero. Well, then in that case, it does have an inverse, okay? So you have to be very, very careful and pay attention to the little details. So here's example three. It says the graph of the function given by f of x equal to x cubed minus one is shown in this figure. And it says, because no horizontal line intersects the graph more than one point, you can conclude that f is a one-to-one -one function. And therefore it does have an inverse. They haven't shown me how to find it, but I'm telling me that one exists. Now I know how to find it because we already know that all you gotta do is swap these points. So the coordinates of this point are one, zero, and the coordinates of this point are negative one or zero, negative one. So if I swap that, I get zero, one. And if I swap that, I get negative one, zero. And so the graph, looks like this. I'm, I'm trying my best to draw it curvy, but you get the idea, okay? It should look like a mirror image of this over that imaginary y equals to x business. Okay, so it should be mirroring over that line y equals to x. So not only can I determine that it, it has an inverse, I can also graph it because we're just using that mirroring concept. Looking at this one, notice that this one fails the horizontal line test. So this one does not have an inverse function. It might have an inverse relationship, but that relationship is not a function. So great, right? If you give me a table, I could swatch them, swap them and tell you the inverse. If you give me a graph, I can mirror it and give you the inverse. But if I give you a function, f of x is this, we still don't know how to find the inverse of it, okay? 
So now we're finally gonna get go through those steps, okay? So for relatively simple functions, such as the one in example one, you can find inverse functions by inspection, just by looking at them. Who on earth can do that, right? Not me. So <laughs> you have to follow a process in order to figure it out. And yeah, that's great for simple functions, right? But what happens when they're more complicated? Then what do I do? I can't just look at it and guess, okay? So um, the key step for this is to do the interchanging of the X and the Y. Remember, that is literally how they defined f of x at the very, very, very beginning, okay? So here are the steps to finding an inverse function. The first thing you do, and I don't always do this, I always wait until I'm done with everything and then I look at what I have and are those two things functions? Then as long as both of them are functions, then I'm good. I don't always draw everything and do the horizontal line test. And I don't expect you to and you don't have a graphing calculator either because you're not allowed to use one. So you can't just go plug it in the calculator and see what it looks like, okay? So I normally don't do step one. Um, if it doesn't have a function, I'll realize it once I already have the inverse. I'll look at that inverse and be like, oh, wait a minute, that's not a function, okay? Um, and I'll explain because it might happen um, today in, in our practice. So we'll see what our practice looks like. It might not happen in our practice, but I do go through these steps, okay? Um, and I don't even, I don't even do this much that much. This step, I mean, you can, but I don't go through that process all too much, okay? I literally just look at my new equation and then decide whether or not that new equation is in fact a function, okay? So the first thing you do is instead of writing f of x equals this, this, or that, you replace the f of x with y. We already know that it's a fancy way of saying y anyway, right? But for computation purposes, it's easier to manipulate stuff when it's a y than when it's an f of x. For some reason, that name with the f of, with the x, it, it throws people off. Okay, and they think like it's F times X and it's not, it's F of something, okay? It's just a name. You're saying a function named Frank and the inputs are X's, okay? Um, so, so that notation really can get confusing in the algebra. So that's why we just like clean it up and make it look like a Y and then I can do all the algebra with a Y, okay? Once you do replace the F of X with the simpler notation Y, then you're gonna take the X's and the Y's and you're gonna swap them, okay? Once you swap them, you have technically crossed over into the realm of inverse, okay? So at that point, you are talking about inverse and Y is the inverse, okay? After you replaced it, you replace the X's and the Y's, you swap them. The new people that are now Y are now um, the inverse, okay? So you solve that thing for y, get y all by itself. So once you have y all by itself, then you're just going to replace it back with the correct name. You know that when you swapped it, you are now in the realm of inverses. So when you rename it at the end, you have to call it the inverse. Okay. Um, and so let's let's see an example of what that looks like. Okay. So here's example four. So I'm gonna follow these steps. And instead of saying f of x, I'm gonna say y. So that is step one. Step two is to interchange the x's and the y, which means all y's become an x and all x's become a y. That is the interchanging part. As soon as you have interchanged them, you are now in the realm of inverses. Now to solve for y, that means to get y by itself, I definitely wanna get rid of this fraction. So I'm gonna multiply by two on both sides to cancel that. And I will end up with two x equals five minus three y. If further, if I wanna get y by itself, I'm gonna to have to minus five. So I get two x minus five equal to negative three y. And then to further completely solve for y, I'm gonna divide both sides by negative three. And so this becomes um, 
2x minus 5 over negative 3 equal to y all by itself. Now, two things I'm going to fix in this step. One is I'm going to swap these. I'm going to put the y on this side. The other is, is we don't like the negative downstairs, so we're going to put it in the front. Okay. And then the very, very, very last step is you already crossed over into the realm of inverses, so this thing is an inverse. And then you're just rewriting that expression. So all you're doing is changing y into a different name at inverse, okay? And then you go and you see, is this a function? This is a function. If I write it differently, it's actually this. This is a line. You got this negative y intercept, and then you're gonna go up to, um, up to and backward three or something like that. And so it's a line that looks kind of like that. Doesn't that pass the vertical line test? It does. And so this is in fact an actual function. And so you're good. Okay. Now, this one, let's go see what that looks like. It says determine whether the function has an inverse or not. Um, if it does, then find the inverse function. So we did graph these things in the past. So I know that this has an x-intercept of um, negative 5 over 6. I know that it has a vertical asymptote of um, x equal to negative 4 over 5. I know that it has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 6 over 5 because the um, degrees are the same. So I took the coefficients. And so if I were to graph that real quick, I also know the y-intercept of um, 0, 0 would be 5 fourths. So let's see. We have negative 5, 6, which would be somewhere here. We have positive 5 fourths, which would be somewhere here. We have 6 fifths. Oh, God, what is this? This is 1.25, and this is 1.2. So the y-intercept is above the horizontal asymptote. So that means the horizontal asymptote is like that, somewhere underneath it. And what else? The vertical asymptote is negative 4 fifths. So let me see. This is negative, where is my calculator? 5 divided by 6 is like negative 0.4. And then four divided by five is negative 0.8. So if this is an x-intercept of negative 0.4, then my x-intercept is negative 0.8, okay? Um, and so I'm not sure what this looks like actually. Um, I have an idea. I think it's gonna go like this and then like that to trail off onto my y-intercept. Um, and since I don't have any more x-intercepts, it's probably going up here, okay? But does that pass the vertical line test? It does. Vertical line test, it passes. So it is a function. Does it pass the horizontal line test? It does, okay? Um, well, let's see. Horizontal line test is 1.2, and y-intercept is 1.25. So yeah, it does. It depends. Can I get another y value of this same value? Because if I have another y value, yes, it's going to go back down, right? Um, oh, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Look at right here. If I go like that, won't I hit that twice? Hmm. I think I might have done something too quick. So x-intercept is going to be negative 5 over 6. This one is going to be negative 4 over 5. That's good. Horizontal asymptote is the same degree. So 6 over 5, 1.2. And then that one is 1.25, right? 5 over 4, 6 over 5. Yeah, so that's it. It doesn't look like it is going to have an inverse function. Um, but to be honest, I don't ever do this, like never, never, never. So I'm thinking this thing is not going to have an inverse, but we'll go check it out. 
I'm thinking that it's not going to, but we'll see. So we're going to change this to Y. And then we're going to interchange the X's and Y's. So this becomes X and this becomes Y. No, it just doesn't have, it's not one to one. So I'm gonna leave what I had up there. I'm gonna pause this. No, I'm not gonna pause it. So remember the X intercepts come from the numerator equal to zero. So in that case, it's six X plus five equal to zero which means 6x equals negative 5, or x equals negative 5, 6, which means x equals negative, um, what is 5, 6? 5 divided by 6 is negative 0 0.83 repeating, okay? The y-intercept is found by plugging in 0. So 6 times 0 plus 5, 5 times 0 plus 4, we end up with 5 fourths, which is 1.25. So I do have those values. I have one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. So I have negative 8.3 is my X value and negative 1.25 or positive 1.25 as my Y value. Now let's go ahead and do our vertical asymptotes. You get from the denominator equal to zero so 5x plus 4 equals 0, 5x equals negative 4, or x equals negative 4 fifths, which means x equals negative 0 0.8. 4 divided by 5, yes, 0 0.8. So this was negative 0 0.833, which means further in is going to be my um, vertical asymptote. Now for the horizontal asymptote, we have to talk about degrees. So the degree of the numerator is a one. The degree of the denominator is also a one. And since they are equivalent to each other, we're gonna take Y equals the leading coefficient of the numerator over the leading coefficient of the denominator, which is six and five, which is six divided by five, 1.2. So then 1.2, this is 1.25, so 1.2 is right below that. Okay, oh, I see what's going on. I had my asymptote on the wrong side. So when my asymptote's there, I can now see that I have this cross and I have the four regions, right? In this region, I'm gonna be doing this. And in this region, I'm gonna be doing this, okay? And so this isn't exactly straight like the way I drew it. It's actually getting closer and closer and closer to this green line, but never touching the green line. And so these values are decreasing constantly. So it doesn't actually, it does pass the horizontal line test. And even down here, it passes the horizontal line test. So it does have an inverse. I knew my numbers were off some way. So if I want to find the inverse, we got to go for it. We change the f of x to y. Then we interchange the x's and the y's. And then I have, I have to solve for y. So I do have this fraction here. So I'm gonna multiply by the denominator to get rid of the, the fraction. So I get x times 5y plus 4 equal to 6y plus 5, which is 5xy plus 4x equal to 6y plus 5. Now, I need to solve for y, which means I need to get my y's over to one side and anything that does not have a y over to the other side. So this is gone and this is gone. I have 5xy minus 6y. And over here, I have 5 minus 4x, positive 5 minus 4x. Then you can factor out a y. And I get this. And then if I divide both sides by those parentheses, I get that y is equal to this, okay? 
Now I'm almost done. All I have to do is change the notation to f inverse of x equal to five minus four x over five x minus six, okay? So I would have never guessed that that's the actual inverse, right? Not all of the signs changed. Um, it does look like the five, the variables swatched over, right? So that instead of it being six x, it's now 5x, and instead of being 5x, it's now 4x. And then the what was on the top is now on the bottom, right? But the signs, like over here, the constant turned negative, and up here, the variables turn negative. I wouldn't have guessed that, okay? So that's not something that you can just like look at and be like, hmm, the inverse is going to be this. You just can't, okay? Um, so you do have to go through that whole process of solving in order to get there. Okay, I think we have one more, um, one more example. Where did it go? Here we go. So this one says, determine whether the function has an inverse, and then if it does, find the inverse. I can tell you right now that this one um, is not one to one. Okay, if I were to graph these, you have um, one, two, three, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So you have four, one, two, three, four, and seven. You have five and four. You have six and three. You have seven and four and then you have eight and seven, and then you have nine and 12, okay? You can see that it kind of has a parabola shape, but it's not a continuous graph. It's just these random points and that's it. But if you notice, it fails the vertical line test twice. Both of these have a Y value of four and both of these have a Y value of seven. So we are gonna say um, this function is not one-to-one -one, and therefore, excuse me, does not have an inverse function. I'm sure it has an inverse, right? I just gotta swap them, but it doesn't have an inverse function, okay? So, that's the end of this section. Um, as you work through your problems, again, always, 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 if you get stuck on some of the problems that you're working on, please email me or message me and remind so I can help you get through those, okay? But other than that, um, I will see you in the next video.